Hello, welcome to the Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster from Contact Renovations and Custom Homes. This week, we are talking with Jared Johannesson from Park Lighting and Furniture. And this week's topic is lighting design and fixtures. And I can't, um, I guess, iterate enough how important a good electrical design is well in advance of the insulation of your light fixtures. We'll talk about that a fair bit today with Jared. Um, too often we see light fix, a client brings beautiful light fixtures to a site only to find out the electrical wasn't roughed in in the right location and that completely undermines the effectiveness and the beauty of the fixture and can be very frustrating for, for many people. So um, today's adventure will be about what's out there for fixture options in the marketplace, different lighting types, and then we'll talk about some general rules as far as when selecting fixtures, um, what to consider, how to lay them out, and what might work best in your space. So Barry, I'll pull Jared into the show in just a second here. It's gonna pull up the show cover. Okay, so um, I will introduce Jared before I bring him on the show. I'm notorious for getting the guest on. I have to do it while they are, are watching me do it. So um, park lighting. Uh, park lighting and furniture is considered by many to be the go-to lighting store in Edmonton and throughout Northern Alberta. They began as a small do-it-yourself electrical shop on White Avenue and they've grown into an extensive 31,000 square foot showroom on 170th Street. Uh, they remain a family owned and operated company with deep roots in the Northern Alberta community. Uh, Jared himself started back with Park uh, back in 2003, sweeping the floors in the warehouse and he moved into sales in 2005. Uh, he trained at their Calgary location, which is Cartwright Lighting and uh, took the American Lighting Association Specialist course in Chicago in 2006. Jared's now the sales manager and uh, a partner at Park Lighting and Furniture. So I see that he's in here. I'm gonna pull him into the show. I'm excited to have him. And I'll say that um, Jared and Jenna did a fantastic job getting me the information I needed for the show, uh, which is great. Super tech savvy and um, it was great to have them pull out the information that we needed for the show in a way that uh, made it easy for us to put it together. So shout out to those guys for that, uh, the background uh, information there. Um, our giveaway item this week, they've uh, graciously offered up two boxes of patio string lights and I'll put up an image of them here soon, but they're like the Edison style light for your patio or backyard. Um, great addition to your outdoor space. And our skill testing question this week is, is light output measured in watts or lumens? And I usually give the answer up super easily, but this week I'm going to hold out a bit and give Jared a, a chat or a chance to come in and explain it a bit more and, and why things have changed a bit in the recent years. So I'm just waiting for Jared to join the show here. Maybe I'll send out a new invite. Uh, give me a second. Jared, if you're watching, you should see a little invitation come out um, and get you to request you join in the show. I'm just going to pull up. There's a shot of the, um, the giveaway item from this week. I'm going to try this again here. Okay. I'll wait for him to come into the show here. So there we go. Jared. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Thanks for joining up. Yeah, thank you for having so, me. Yeah, so like, let's talk a bit quickly about the giveaway item and our skill testing question here because I don't like making it too hard for people, but I want them to think a little bit about it. And um, the question was, is light output measured by watts or lumens? And why don't we talk a bit about that? Because things have changed in recent years and yeah. Yeah, Everyone certainly. Wants. So uh, up until just a few years ago, I guess when uh, LED technology came on, came on board, everybody was uh, measuring light output by by watts, so they, we still get people in coming into the store today saying, "I have a 60 watt bulb. I need a, a 60 watt. Uh, I need the same light output I had before from a 60 watt bulb." And right. even within a 60 watt bulb, the light output is measured very differently. So, um, light output is measured in lumens as opposed to watts. So this is when you're looking at uh, an LED bulb. Um, you'll notice it says. Um, whether 800 lumens, which would be comparable to a 60 watt bulb or, or somewhere around 1200 to 1500 lumens would be somewhere around a 100 watt bulb. Um, that gives you a bit, a bit of a benchmark of what, what, uh, what you're looking for when you're looking for replacement light bulbs. Awesome. Well, thanks. There you go. There's the answer. So 
Um, to be entered into the draw, enter the correct answer in the comments. And then at the end of the show, we'll do the draw for the, the giveaway of those two, two packs of the string lights. Um, yeah, great. So I guess let's talk a bit about park lighting or furniture. And I mentioned in the intro there, um, kind of the background. It is a family-owned company. But why don't you tell us a bit of the story of park lighting before we get into the, the more technical side of our, our show today? Yeah, for sure. So uh, park lighting, as you had mentioned, started uh, way back in 1980. But the uh, it was started, it was purchased by my, uh, my grandpa, my uncle, and my dad. Uh, and they had all originally just started KVR Electric. And they thought, hey, a lighting store really pairs well with the the electrical business that they were in, and how could they how could they use that to their advantage? And so in the nineteen eighties, when they purchased uh, Park Lighting, and at the time it was it was just a really really small do it yourself electrical shop. Uh, people would come in for parts, and uh, and it didn't take off immediately like they they had hoped. You know, they had a grand opening and uh, brought in two dozen donuts and. At the end of the day, one donut was eaten, and it was uh, it was a slow, a slow start to the market. But uh, uh, since then, um, we've we've expanded quite a bit. Uh, we've uh, Park Lighting and KVR have have separated a little bit in regards to ownership. But uh, I now have uh, my brother in law works with me. Uh, I have another brother in law that works at the store as well. My wife does her social media. Um, my dad uh, is still involved in the company as well. Um, and we have very close family friends that also work at the store, both in Edmonton and, and Calgary. Um, we grew, uh, I think we've grown, I think we've moved four or five times now since from where we originally started to where we are now. Uh, we, we were on White Ave for a little while. We started a second store in, uh, in uh, West Edmonton Mall uh, that didn't prove as, uh, as uh, fruitful as we had hoped. But uh, uh, where we are now, we started. We we really looked for a long time for a new location, and this this uh, store on 170th Street. Um, we've expanded now four times, uh, expanding into furniture, and uh, creating creating more space so we can really show as much lighting as possible. Nice. Yeah, you guys have an amazing showroom there for sure. And anybody who's driven down, I guess that's Mayfield Road. Yep, Mayfield um, Road on 170th Street. Yeah. Yeah, you'd see that uh, that showroom. It's hard to miss. It's a it's a serious space. And if you're looking for lighting. Um, Good luck. Get a guide when you're in there. Go talk to a salesperson because there's so many options out there available now. And I think uh, it's a good time to transition, I guess, into the options that are out there now. And I think uh, let's start with the bulbs themselves, right? So we've seen over the years we had incandescent bulbs, we had halogen, and now we're into LED. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because LED is really kind of taking over as as the go-to light fixture, but I've had some clients in on the renovation side of things that have insisted they don't want LED, they want to stick with halogen, they prefer the, the color, the warmth of the light. And uh, I, I guess they were skeptical about the staying power of LED, which, you know, I think that's kind of a, a non-concern now, but let's talk a bit about that. And what do you see out there within what you guys have for offer at the showroom and what you see moving most often? And is there a time and place where you'd recommend you know, a halogen or incandescent bulb still, instead of just going to, to LED across the board. So from, from the um, invention of the LED bulb way back, there hasn't been much, or sorry, not LED, the incandescent bulb uh, way back, there hasn't been much change to the light bulb uh, for the last basically 100, 100 years. And so uh, it, it was time for, for there, be to, there to be some innovation in light bulbs. Um, the fluorescent bulb, which was an, kind of uh, an in-between stage between the incandescent bulb and the LED bulb. What didn't really quite tick all the boxes from a, from a residential lighting aspect. It wasn't uh, a nice light. The color of light wasn't wasn't great in terms of how it how it showed colors. Uh, and uh, it took a little while to turn to full brightness, heat up the ballast, and the dangerous mercury that's inside the light bulb. That was obviously not something that people wanted inside their homes. So the only real benefit of going from incandescent to a fluorescent bulb was that it was more energy efficient and a little bit longer lasting light bulb. What we're seeing now is that a lot of people are making the jump to an LED bulb and the technology that's uh, been put in towards LED bulbs is moving very, very fast. Everybody's trying to find something that's uh, more efficient, higher light output, better color temperature, and then also at a lower price. Uh, and what we're seeing is that the demand for LED bulbs is almost completely taking over incandescent bulbs. The cost of an LED bulb is now so low that it makes a lot of sense to, to move away from a standard 60 watt bulb and, and jump into what would be probably a, a seven or nine watt LED bulb. Um, the, there are definitely pros and cons to both. Um, for an LED bulb, the benefits would be 
very, very long lasting. Um, we're talking, you know, uh, 15 to 25,000 hours, even, even higher than that in some cases. And, and the way they judge that is basically on um, average residential use, which would be about three hours a day. Um, so the, the, the bulb life expectancy is way, way longer. A standard incandescent bulb is expected to last about 1,500 hours. So you're looking well over 10 times the, the life expectancy of a light bulb. Um, there's a number of other benefits. Uh, you can choose the color temperature of light. Okay, and so this is very much a, a, a personal preference and I can certainly give a little bit of guidance on, on what I would suggest. Um, you really need to think about the application that, that it's going in. Um, for residential applications, generally we try to stay to a 2700 or 3000 K color temperature. And when I'm talking about color temperature, that's the range from candlelight to natural daylight. Candlelight being quite warm on the spectrum and natural daylight being quite, quite a cold blue light. And so obviously there's, there's a large range there. The 2,700 to 3,000 is still definitely on the warm end of the spectrum, but not, uh, not coming across as cold. And the reason why we like that for residential applications is because specifically, uh, even, even more north, the, the further north you go, people tend to prefer a little bit warmer light. They want to come back into their home, this is their sanctuary, this is the place where they want to come back and mm -hmm. relax. Um, for, for office spaces, we'd go a different route. And for task areas, um, specifically laundry room, walk-in closet, maybe you have a home office, uh, we would go to a different color temperature. But generally for a house with the amount of woods that people are putting into their houses to keep that warmth in the wood, we really want to stay to a warmer color temperature. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd say too, there's like so much more flexibility now also within the LED light, the fixture itself, because like you, I should have showed a picture earlier about backsplash, but we're using these LED light strips in such a new way now, as far as creating, whether it be task lighting, whether it be some sort of under cabinet um, lighting, maybe toe kick lighting, something that can replace even a night light, like in our, in our bathrooms often now, and I'll, I'll pull up a quick picture here. We're starting to go kind of default anytime we have a wall mounted vanity, or if we even down to the toe kick, we'll do an under cabinet light there that's on a motion sensor. So basically, if you walk in there in the middle of the night, you need to use the washroom. You don't need to worry about hitting the light switch, and it'll just come on with a really subtle um, light down at the floor level. And I'm realizing now those pictures didn't load, so it's too bad, but you get the idea. And it's a nice way, you know, to, to light the space. Well, here's, here's one image, I guess. You can kind of get the sense here for this. So you come in, you don't need to hit the switch, and it comes on. And that's the LED. is like it's like a small bulb, and it can be done in a strip or rope, whatever it is, you could backlight things with it. It's really, really innovative now. And I think um, here's one as well, similar. And you can see not too often you crawl down on the floor and look underneath your vanity. This one's missing the drawer too, but it's not a job we're just finishing up right now. Uh, turnovers at the end of the week. But I really like what it does for the space. It creates a cool lighting effect and it's super practical as well. So that's certainly another thing with LED is it definitely um, opened up new areas of application to, for lighting. Um, the toe kick you, you mentioned for, for um, uh, waking up in the middle of the night. I have two young kids that are learning how to potty train and it's fantastic that they, they don't wake up all the way and, and they're able to safely make it to the bathroom. So it's a, it's, a, it's a safety concern as well for definitely older people too. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. I guess another thing about the lighting we should talk a bit about is, is layering. And I, we can talk, we'll get more technically into it. And you guys sent some great little slides about some guidelines and considerations when you're picking a lighting fixture and kind of rules for standard heights and clearances. But I think layering is something we're talking about. And there's a couple of pictures here that do a great job of depicting that. And here you can see they have, you know, up at the ceiling level, there's some, it's not actually a pot light anymore. They're, I guess, an LED panel light is what they're technically called. Yeah. Um, and then you here you have some pendant lighting. You can see there's some backlit, um, that might be an under cabinet light at the bar area there. Um, and it, Let's talk a bit about layering and how you can achieve a certain look and and function by by doing it and doing it well. So one thing about layering is is first uh, knowing what what you're going to use the space for. So for example, in your kitchen here, um, we have multiple task areas. We have the island as a task area. We have that uh, that back counter as a, as a task area, and then uh, and then just the general kitchen. I mean, um, if you're prepping a kitchen for a Thanksgiving dinner, you're going to be moving around and you need just overall light, uh, or when you're cleaning the space. But you want to be able to control that control that. Uh, the, the amount of light and where you have light for different different applications. Um, right now, it looks like it's it's very well lit. Uh, you're going to have uh, you're going to be able to safely prepare the dinner. Um, but maybe if you're having uh, people over, you want to dim dim the lights down, uh, the under cabinet lights back 
uh, dim them down, maybe turn off the recess lights altogether and just have the pendant lights to create a real, a, a lot of ambience. Mm -hmm. And that way people can maybe enjoy the dinner under more of like uh, the type of lighting that they'd see at a high end restaurant. And yep. I think you've really prepared that uh, that kitchen for that. I mean, being able to control the lights independently and, and dim them to control the light levels is very, very important to, to achieve that overall look. Yeah, absolutely. I guess we talked about dimming a bit and we should address that because I see quite often, um, you know, in the stores, you'll notice that the LED bulbs are sold as dimmable or non-dimmable. And, and it's also fair to say now that one dimmer is not equal to another. And let's talk a bit about that so people understand, look, if you want to dim your lights, if they're LED, you have to do a little bit of research first. Um, so yeah, I guess Jared, maybe you can address that for us. So I guess going back to going back to the difference between incandescent and LED bulbs, the original incandescent bulb, um, basically a dimmer, all it did was control the amount of uh, uh, power going towards the light bulb, which then controlled how much the uh, filament inside would light up. So it was a very, very simple process. You dim the light, the, the amount of power going towards the uh, towards the light bulb, the less light you're going to get. And it's going to also be a little bit of a warmer light. So as it dims, it goes from you know, the 2700 Kelvin temperature down to maybe 2200 or less. And so you can dim it right down to 0%. With LED being a totally different technology and, and, uh, it's, it, and being so... Uh, efficient as far as how much wattage, wattage is required to create the light, they're much more sensitive to fluctuations. And so as you're dimming, you might sometimes see that it, that the dimming levels jump around a little bit. And this might be due to the type of dimmer being used, um, specific wiring in the house. There are, Lutron being one of the biggest names in, in dimming seems to have done probably the most research that I can find in regards to uh, dimming capabilities and they have a large range of products everything from what they would describe as sort of their um, entry-level model uh, to you know a, a two three hundred dollar commercial dimmer where you can uh, control lights right down to zero percent I think that there are some other differences LED technology when you dim it uh, you're, you're not going to dim it. It's not going to warm up as it dims like it would a standard light bulb. A standard light bulb, like I mentioned before, warms and that creates a little bit more ambiance. Whereas a lot of LED technology, unless you're looking at brand, brand new LED technology, it's just going to stay the same color temperature, but just get a little bit dimmer. And that's something that people are going to have to get used to a little bit because it is changing the way the way people light their space. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I think it's something you know really important from the get go, and especially in the renovation world, it's a bit easier, I guess. Um, in new construction to do your lighting plan and and in advance map it all so the the layout's correct you have the clearances that you need you can you know I mean even down to the switching you want to be able to layer properly it has to be convenient to be able to cruise around and dim and turn off lights if they're spread out around a room then that makes it a bit you're ping-ponging around from wall to wall adjusting lighting switches mm -hmm. or dimmers so in a renovation it's a bit more of a challenge because often a client doesn't want to completely rewire their home so we're trying to use existing switches and circuits and trying to minimize how much we move uh, the electrical roughing components. And that can really pose a challenge, especially with, you know, you pick a particular light fixture that, you know, maybe is a beautiful light fixture, but doesn't give off that much useful light. It's more there to make an impression and it's more of a, almost like a piece of art in some way. And you have to then layer appropriately to make that work, right? So then you have to plan out your 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 recess lighting you can plan out your under cabinet lighting and maybe you need to add some pendants or sconces whatever it is and to make it work together so i think it's really really important that if you're planning a renovation that you have a good conversation with the team at park lighting or whoever you're getting your light fixtures from and with your designer about not just how pretty are the fixtures how do they need to be wired to work effectively and your contractor needs to know that stuff early so we can do up the electrical schematic and make sure it all gets roughed in in the right locations because you can imagine you know how bad some of this stuff could look if for example in this image if that little it's not really a chandelier i guess but it's got some dangly stuff on in the middle of that oval if that wasn't properly centered if it was off to one end it would sure look out of place and that's something that you know takes some planning well in advance of installing the fixture so um again, what do you see on your end like do you do you see a more common issue that comes up regularly whether in the lighting world when it comes to the contracting side of things is there like a common challenge mm -hmm. that you see okay. from your side i would say uh the the most common one is uh is having the light centered over the dining room table 
Some people might, uh, might have a dining table that you know has leaves in it or or they decide to put a buffet on the side and suddenly the light isn't centered over top of the dining room table and they have to find a way to either swag the light over uh you bring a chain over which obviously a new construction or even a brand new renovation doesn't make the house look completely finished uh and so that's probably one of the biggest struggles we see uh <laughs> there's a beautiful picture there and then at the, at the same time uh, uh you mentioned a little bit earlier about vanity vanity lights and that's it that's a huge concern for us too uh generally that's one of the first questions that we ask um if someone is picking a vanity light is your electrical box centered because that opens up so many more options for you but if it isn't centered we do have to come up with a plan where we have a larger backplate that allows us to center the light with the electrical box being off centered yeah absolutely that that vanity light one it comes up so often and especially you know if if we don't take on bathroom rentals on their own very often anymore unless it's a, a major of washroom reno but for a client that's trying to minimize their costs and they and they don't want to change the rough ends because that requires drywall repair and you know increased electrical costs you know often we see a client come back with a light fixture that doesn't that has simply it mounts dead center on the electrical box and if that's the case but that box isn't centered we got a problem right whereas some some light fixtures can be adjusted as far as where the back plate sits on the box itself right so you know, in this particular bathroom I'm showing here, this has these triple units, but this, these one had to be mounted dead center. The electrical box is directly behind the center light on each of those fixtures. So it took some, a little bit of math and measuring to make sure this was laid out so that it cleared A, the distance from the mirrors and that it was centered over the sinks and in between that storage tower and the wall. So there, there is some, you know, some legwork that has to happen. And like you said, Jared, it's a, it comes up all the time. And it's like something that I think people need to be more aware of up front when you're picking your light fixture. So buyer beware. We certainly have some options like that for, uh, for dining room lights as well, like a large base that allows us to be a little bit flexible. I mean, we're not going to be able to move uh, a dining room light across a room or anything like that. But there are some bases available that uh, allow for a little bit of flexibility for dining rooms as well. Absolutely. Um, I'll show a couple of some images here of some lighting fixtures you sent. So this one, I don't know the fixture myself, but this one would look to me like it needs to be mounted dead centered over the electrical box. Otherwise, if that plate could shift, it would be off center. It might look a little bit off, right? Yeah, um, certainly. You know, whereas if you, no, oh, that's not, sorry. That's not, I don't think that's a, this one has a larger back plate. So there's a chance that might be able to mount, be mounted off center, in which case that would save you some electrical costs. So, when you're selecting your fixtures, you should consider those things just to avoid a headache later when it comes time to put the light fixture up and you've already been through paint and drywall and everything's done and, and now you have to open up a wall again. That kind of goes back to also, uh, I mean, the earlier you can get involved in, this, in, in the planning stage of your electrical, the better. So if you're doing a big renovation and you do want, um, whether it's your sink off centered, you really need to picture how that's going to look. Do you want your light centered over your sink or do you want it centered over the vanity? Um, same thing when we've got a lot of people asking about uh, either wall lights as reading lights beside the bed or pendants over the bedside table and doing the measurements and, and making sure that is perfect and giving your, your contractor all the information you have about your bed and, and what you're going to put in that space is so important to make sure that that pendant or wall light is, is centered over top of your bedside table. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a lot of time goes into it too, right? And that's something that we factor on our end when we're doing renovations uh, or new home building in general. It's plan time of planning that's needed to make sure it gets laid out properly the first time. So, you know, when you're considering renovation, you should be, you know, asking your contractor, do you have time in planning for on the electrical side, for lighting, for the layouts? Because if he's just thinking he's going to manage a sub trade and all good, you're not letting your electrician decide where the lights are going to go. You need to lay it out up front with your designer um, and make sure that everything's in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the giveaway item again real, real quick here. So Jared and Park Lighting have offered up, there we go, a, two boxes of these uh, string lights, Edison lights, I guess, is how they're affectionately known. Yeah. Um, to be qualified for the giveaway item, you need to answer this skill testing question. Is light output measured in watts or lumens? I've seen a bunch of correct answers already entered in the comments, but enter your answer there. And at the end of the show, we'll do a, uh, a random draw and we'll announce the winner then. All right. Um, let's talk a bit about some of these slides you sent that are giving 
kind of some guidelines for clearance. So this one, of course, now my big head's going to be in the way of a whole bunch of these things, but this one actually says great rooms for ceilings 10 feet or taller. So uh, these aren't really in any specific order. I'll just whack them all through them as we, as they appear on my phone. Um, but let's talk a bit about the rule of thumb here. So, uh, it, it's it's tough because I think there is it is a rule of thumb, but I would say that every light fixture appears different in each space. So the the more airy and light the fixture feels, probably the lower and the little bit bigger that you could go if if it's um, a little bit denser fixture, something that's maybe not as transparent, uh, heavier heavier in design. Um, you probably want to raise it a little bit higher so it just doesn't feel like it's it's either right on top of your head and 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 that makes us makes it feel uncomfortable as well. Um, for for the picture that you're showing there, generally. For most applications that we have, people people have six foot eight or eight foot doors. Generally, on a six foot eight door, maybe you have a ceiling height of nine feet, something like that. You probably want to keep the the, the light fixture minimum of seven feet off the ground, and that that gives uh, someone that's six foot six feet tall lots of clearance above their head and uh, uh, and allows still still a sizable fixture. You can have something you know with twenty four inches in height. Um, yeah. When you're looking at a, a two tier fixture like that, maybe a 12, 14 foot ceiling. Uh, then, then you still want to keep it a little bit higher, just the fixtures a little bit bigger. Maybe we drop it, uh, drop it down to eight or nine feet off the floor, uh, depending on the door height. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the rule of thumb, I would say one thing to consider is practically how you're going to use the space. So I think about the front entry. I think about our fantastic Canadian winters, and there's a chance someone might pull a sweater off at the front door. So take your height and then reach up and, and add that extra arm length are you going to hit the fixture with your hands, right? And those are the kind of little things to consider, or do you have that like awkwardly tall uncle that's going to come <laughs> by regularly? You might want to consider that as well, right? So little things to consider. I mean, these are rules of thumb, but um, you know, you have to consider your circumstances as well. This is a great one about like, the around a round dining table. Uh, recently on a site we're doing now, we were laying out um, the lighting for, uh, above a round uh, dining room table. So in the end, we marked it out on the floor and here's the dead center where the, where the table is going to sit. And then we marked out where the, um, the light fixture is going to be centered above the table. And that's fantastic. And one thing we didn't talk about at the time is the clearance between the table and the bottom of the light fixture, which I know is going to be coming up in about a month when we're into hanging fixtures. So there's the issue of centering things and then there's also the height to which it hangs. This one addresses more um, the size of the picture, but let's talk a bit about that and then we'll talk about clearances. Yeah, so basic, basically in this case, what they're saying is uh, if you have say a 40 inch, 48 inch wide table, the minimum height should be 24 inch, or sorry, width should be 24 inches uh, up to three quarters of the, the diameter of the table. Uh, this, this gives people, you know, clearance if they need to reach to the center uh, and without, without bumping their head as, as much as possible. I mean, obviously if you have that awkward tall uncle, uh, he's used to dodging his head and dodging lights, big light fixtures already. So uh, still make it comfortable for the people that are living in the house. Um, so yeah, in this case, they're, they're talking about half the diameter of the, uh, of the table being a minimum, uh, diameter. Okay. Uh, in regards to ceiling height and how far you want to hang it off the table. Um, this again, depends a little bit on who's living in the house. If you're talking with, uh, people that are six feet or taller, maybe the height goes a little bit higher. Personally, I like my light to be quite low. Uh, in my house, it hangs down to about five foot three off the ground. So 63 inches. Uh, generally, the rule of thumb is on an eight foot ceiling, about 30 inches off the table, um, nine foot ceiling, 33 inches off the table, 10 foot ceiling, 36 inches off the table, and, and kind of goes up from there. Uh, though that's, that's, again, a rule of thumb and, and just, just basic math if someone was asking me those kinds of questions. Now, what you showed here is a picture of an island, and uh, generally, I don't like the island lights and the dining room light to be at the same height. I consider them different spaces, and so normally, I'd have the dining room light hung lower because the table itself is usually lower than, than the counter height that you'd have at your island. So often, what I'll do is I'll hang the dining room light at, at about five and a half feet off the floor, and then the, the island light's at six feet. That way, you can still comfortably talk across the island without the lights being in the way and you're not dodging them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It depends too on your island, whether you've got the raised bar and the taller stools or whether they're down at a 36 inch countertop height as well. Right. And one thing to consider too, is depending on what you have over your island, um, you know, often that's actually a task light and depending on the size of the fixture and how low it is, 
um, is your head going to cast a shadow onto your workspace, depending where that light's been hung as well? So there's some things to consider, uh, you know, about not just the beauty of the light itself, but how it's going to work practically as you're trying to light your space. And if your intention is just to make it look nice and make, you know, romantic dining mood light, even that's one thing. But if you're going to try and, you know, prepare dinner under that light, you got to make sure that you're not casting a shadow of your own across there. And again, a lot of that has to do with uh, flexibility and, and being able to plan. If you have the recess lights, those, those will add to the task light as well. And again, try to eliminate the shadows while you're, you know, cutting up cucumbers and preparing, preparing the salad. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess as far as size of the fixture over a surface, I mean, I, I, I pulled a bunch of kind of funny electric or lighting design fail images that I'll show later. And one of them was this like mammoth light fixture above the island it was as wide as the entire island and it, it looked it was it was very oversized and um i guess let's talk a bit about that and why that would be considered i guess a design fail on some level so i think one one thing uh is the shape of the t of the light over the table so uh, i mean for a number of years we were used to round chandeliers over rectangular tables but now with so many more options available in lighting uh, people with rectangular tables are opting towards uh, fixtures that are also rectangular to complement the shape of the shape of the table. In the image shown there, um, it looks like, say, ballpark the the island or or let's call it a dining room table was eight feet long. The fixture length at max you'd want it six feet, and that gives you twelve inches from each side, so that again there's there's space to reach into the table and make sure it's comfortable. But at the same time, then if your if your table width is uh, is 48 so it's a 48 by 8 table you'd want the fixture to be maybe no wider than 24 inches wide so a 6 by 6 by uh, uh, 2 uh, light fixture um, and that's again we're talking maximum sizes that might even be a bit big for that type of space okay true enough well said I had a couple comments here and speaking of that awkwardly tall uncle I got McLean 1974 commenting I don't know how many times he's banged his head on low-hanging lights he's a Client and friend of mine, he's a very tall man, and uh, I, can, I can see how that would happen. We got Kitchen Masters Inc. also commenting on that they have a chandelier over where our dinner table used to be, which is just off our back door. Every single tall person who's come into the house has banged their head on the fixture. So I think, you know, if that's, if that's your space, and every time someone tall is coming in, uh, you might want to consider reconsidering, consider reconsidering, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to get at here. Anyways, what fixture you have in that space, right? Because if it's a problem, you know, I'm, I'm a smaller guy. I'm five foot six. So I don't hit my head on much. Um, but definitely, if you're above average in height, then take that into consideration. Or if your family is, well, that would be worth thinking about, too. It's also possible the light, the light could be modified to be shortened, uh, whether it's just reducing True. the amount of pain or, or rods and, and hang it higher to the ceiling so it's more comfortable for everybody walking through. Yeah, absolutely. A couple other rule of thumb images here, and then we can move on into some... Uh, some other shots about different fixtures and we'll get into the, some of the funny stuff here in a minute too. So I like this and it's too bad some of these icons are covering up here, but uh, you know, in the entry your hallway, clearances again, we're talking head height, but then also off the side walls. And we come into this clearance from, especially with the recessed lighting, how far do you want your LED panel light off the side walls around it? What kind of spacing between them? And we'll, we'll talk more about the recessed stuff, I guess, in a bit, we'll address this you know, this pendant in this uh, example, or it looks like a pendant. Yeah. Um, yeah, so what, what are your thoughts on clearance? So gen this, is, uh, this is something similar to the front entry. Generally, I think what they're talking about here is a, a little bit lower ceiling height and people might be uh, walking under this space. And so they're saying here, a minimum of seven feet off the floor. Uh, and and what, you, what you kind of talked about is if someone is reaching up, seven feet is, is fairly easy to reach. Uh, the, the, a door jam uh, on a standard door is six foot eight. So that's only four inches higher. So a lot of people can still reach that. So if they are, you want to make sure you're picking something uh, practical for the space is, is a big uh a big uh, thing to think about. If it is a place where people are putting on their jacket, maybe consider sucking up the light or, or, or finding a light fixture that's a little bit smaller in space uh, in regards to height. The four foot minimum from the sides, I mean, I think that's that's depends on the space. So I I know that my, my mudroom area isn't going to be eight feet wide, so I'm not gonna be able to put a, a, a fixture even in there if they're telling me minimum of four feet wide. So take into consideration the space that you have and make sure the, the size of the light in regards to width matches the space. Absolutely. And that's a big consideration, too, because we see often people put 
these oversized fixtures in. And it's like furniture. If your space has a limitation, you should acknowledge that and respect it. And don't put oversized fixtures in a very small area, unless it's a look you're going for, right? If, you know, if packed is your thing, well, then give her. But um, I think, you know, I mean, if you have a smaller space, I think you should be, you know, consider that when you're planning what fixtures to put in there. Um, here's back to the dining room table um, comment. So just a note to you guys that are watching. Um, we'll put these notes together in a summary for you so you can have kind of a cheat sheet available um, for use when you're planning your reno or obviously get a hold of Jared and his team at, at Park Lighting and they'll be happy to coach you through it. But this is really helpful information because I think it's something that I know for us, we work with a few different electrical contractors and every person has their preference on heights and clearances. And I think ultimately it comes down to only one person's really opinion matters and that's the client making sure they're happy with it, but we're here to guide and coach them so they make a good choice and come to the right conclusion, hopefully, that works for them. So it starts with your sales staff at your lighting store and it moves on to your contractor and there's a conversation with the electrician and then it's full, it should come around full circle that everyone's on board with the same plan. Yeah. Anyhow, um, dining room table clearances, you know, we talked about this a bit earlier as far as the size of the lights set back from the edge of the table as well as clearance above it. You have any other notes to comment on here? Yeah, so in the picture here, they're showing a round fixture. I would say six inches from the from the edge of the table. Um, probably is a little bit tight. Uh, that 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 would be hanging right right in my face if I was standing standing up there. So I would probably lean it, try to try to get something that matches the shape of the table as opposed to something that's round that allows you to get something that I think would be a little bit better suited for the size of the space. But again, it comes down to design uh, a design preference, and and sometimes people prefer the round fixture over the rectangular table. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I mean, that starts, it's a conversation with your designer. And I mean, there's so much to consider, uh, whether it's renovation or new construction, like it's amazing how, how much everything connects, whether it's your furniture and your lighting, your electrical layouts, you know, convenience of how things are switched and dim, the layering, all this stuff has to work together. Then you have different surface finishing that will reflect light differently, whether you have a polished light colored countertop, whether you like how much texture is in the room within the finishings, like all of it has to work together or you can end up with a backsplash that looks like a mirror by accident. You can end up with a reflection somewhere you don't want it, kind of like in front of my eyes right now from the light <laughs> above my desk. You know, this is supposed to help light me up for the show, but I realize sometimes it makes me look like I'm an alien. So give some thought to how you plan things because and all the layers of how it needs to work together it takes a village to plan a good project. And again, and again, how you use the space. So right again, in that, uh, in that image you have there, the lights are facing up. Uh, I have a lot of older clients that, you know, what they want to, whether it's a board game or they're reading a magazine or a newspaper, and that's just not going to give them the task light down to the table that they need. And so if they want a light fixture like that, we have to find a supplemental light source to make sure there's task light down to the table, whether that's, uh, a recess light on either side to give that task light down to the table and you can control it independently. And uh, all of this depends on the budget of, of the project, obviously, but um, there's certainly ways that we can do it to, to make sure you have the ambient light for your Thanksgiving dinner, but you have the task light for when you want to uh, have game night or have, uh, or read the newspaper. Yeah, absolutely. Let's switch to this image here that actually pulled this up as kind of a design fail image. And I think, the point of the image initially was to show how the pendants are not properly centered over the, the island. But as I looked at the photo, I thought, you know, I guess it depends on the user and where you want the light, right? Maybe yeah. they use the overhang side of this for some, I don't know what, making puzzles or something, who knows? And they need a lot of light right there. They might have planned it this way, but generally speaking in our projects, you know, we're centering those pendants directly over the countertop of the island. and. Again, like we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of planning that has to go into exactly, you know, what your clearance is between your two, your countertop and your island, where that puts your island cabinets, plus factor and overhang, then fine center, then rough in your electrical. A lot needs to go into researching that. So, you know, for a lot of my clients, if this was how we left their lighting over their island, it would be a deal breaker. Right. Or for me, it would be, I'd be, you know, we'd be opening up the ceiling and moving over the light boxes and we'd be doing a drywall repair and a paint patch. And then, you know, they go back up centered. So, you know, again, planning, planning is key. I agree. Um, 
speaking of great planning, I'm going to show you just a fantastic image I found today that um, epitomizes poor planning. Or maybe it doesn't. I don't know what this person's goal is, but um, there we go. I, I don't know if that was set up as a joke or what, but holy smokes. Um, I guess if you wanted some light to play basketball, you're going to get lighting for one or two shots. And then, and then you're done. Yeah, but, I think that uh, we'll be getting a call for some replacement glass pretty soon. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, here's another couple simple one. Oh, you can't see it, but um, it's got this decorative, what's that called? I forget. The Medallion. Name. Medallion. Yeah. And then you have a chandelier mounted off center of the medallion, right? I think, you know, like you just lost the plot when it comes to the point of the medallion, for sure, right? Certainly, yeah. Here's a, here's a classic. Oh, you can't see it. This one, not probably not the look they were going for, but again, I mean, and I mean, hard call to know that this might happen, but there's got to be some uh, general equation you can work out for angles and light reflection that might help to uh, have prevented something like this. And if you have the opportunity to see the light in person and see how it lights up the space, that's that's very yeah. important. That's I mean, that's that's what our showroom stands for, so that you get the chance to see the light in person, see how it's going to light light, see if it uh, creates shadows on the wall. It's not something that's yeah. easily easily something you see uh, from online pictures. Yeah, oh, absolutely, I agree. This one too, outdoor lighting, but I I can't imagine this was the look they were going for. Um, uh, maybe it was. I don't know. I guess. I mean, it looks. I don't know. Anyways, that is just an idea of what probably could have been planned uh, a little bit better. Uh, it's one forty-one. We should probably do our final shout out here for the giveaway. So we've got a couple boxes of these awesome string Edison lights up for grabs. So Jared's got them in his in his hands there. To be entered into the draw, you need to answer the question: Is light output measured in watts or lumens? And there's a bunch of the correct answer already entered in the comments. Enter yours in there now. Anybody with the right answer is entered into the draw, which we'll do uh, probably in about 10 minutes from now. So um, good luck to you. All right. Um, I guess I have all these photos of these fixtures we can talk about, but that's before I get into that, I think, so what, what, what makes one fixture better than another? I think there's a, uh... One thing that the technology going into going into fixtures, uh, if you're talking about LED, there's obviously uh, different levels of quality going into the LED product. Um, the color of light, the the there's we talked about the Kelvin temperature of light, but there's a, another element of lighting called the color rendering index, and this is basically how well the light shows uh, colors. Now, basically, the the inventory or uh, the the minimum would be 80 CRI, and that's and that's uh, what we're used to as far as light quality um, and what we've seen for a long time, but there's a strong industry push mainly led by California to, to make all LED product 90 CRI and that's going to help the design industry and, and how well uh, it shows floors and, and maybe the, the paint colors that you picked at the paint store uh, look consistent in your house. And that's very important. And that's one also big difference between uh, halogen and, and LED is that halogen is 100 CRI and that's that's why a lot of people are still attracted to halogen light and, and the color that it go, that it gives, whereas LED quality hasn't hasn't quite gotten there. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to quality of, of the light fixture itself, uh, I, there's, I mean, there's European brands that do uh, fantastic work with glass and, and brass and some different constructions and bringing different materials and and, uh, and even import import companies we see, we see that as well. Uh, there's there's little details, design details that go into light fixtures that can make a whole difference. Whether it's got um, little components that are plastic, or are they or are they put the effort into make them metal? Are uh, the bases of the fixture, the canopies that attach to the ceiling? Do you see the screws? Do you see how it mounts? Is there ways that they could have concealed that to make that look a little bit sharper? Mm -hmm. um, the color of the glass on the fixture. Do you see a green? Uh, tone in it is it uh, I believe it's described as like a recycled glass and, and sometimes to me that's a bit of a deterrent in the glass and these are little details that might not have been noticeably uh, or, or first uh, perceived but but it is something that is worth uh, worth taking a look at feel the outdoor fixtures you know are they are they going to uh, hold up to our elements mm -hmm. um, are they going to discolor quickly um, there is significant different qualities in exterior lights and something to something to pay attention to for sure Absolutely. And I say this kitchen, for example, has got four lights over the over the island for pendants. And these were metal with they did have a, a glass lens at the bottom. But um, 
you know, you can imagine if, if one of these was damaged on install or after the fact, whatever happened, and you need to order a replacement, you know, one of the concerns I would have is, is it going to be a, an exact match to what was previously supplied? And that's all about quality control. And, and uh, you know, you'll see a big variation between manufacturers and suppliers. And, you know, we had one recently where the glass, um, what do you call it? The Whatever. It was a glass. The lens, yeah. There you go. The lens broke. And it was a colored, kind of a stained glass thing. And we ordered a new one and it came. And, you know, the ones that were there originally were kind of an orange hue. And it came back red. So we had one that didn't match the other three. And, it, you know, their response was, well, they're all handmade and hand blown and there's no, and so we, in the end, had to order four, either have the client accept one didn't fully match or order four more that were made in the same batch, right? It's similar to dye lots, I guess, when you get into tile and flooring, right? So it's uh, things to consider for sure, but I think it makes a big difference where you're buying it from, who made it, and who's checking on it. If it's, if it's really inexpensive, you might want to try to find out why. Certainly. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay. So let's see here. We have 15 minutes left. We'll go through a few fixtures here. I'll just kind of whack them all through them. Um, where would you put a fixture like this? So uh, what we try to do with, with a lot of the fixtures that we bring in is uh, talk about where they can all be placed. And this one, for example, it can be modified so that the, the uh, arms are more vertical or more horizontal. Uh, so this could be uh, a dining room. This could be an entry, a stairway, a bonus room with a vaulted ceiling. Or uh, if you have a 10-foot ceiling, it could be something uh, to put in a den. You're going to get a lot of light output. Um, you just have to be used to the exposed light bulbs and, and how sharp that light can be. Yep, absolutely. Um, there's one here which kind of has that decorative... I can't see where the actual bulbs are. And I guess just on a quick tangent here, I, I was at a client's house yesterday and they had this big, massive uh, hanging fixture like this above their entry. And they had a vaulted ceiling there, so it's quite high up. And the little LED bulbs were hidden inside this big web of, of wires. And my first thought was, oh my goodness, the minute that one bulb is done, and maybe that's 10 years from now, I think they're going to be better off trying to replace the fixture than trying to swap out a light bulb. I that guess. is uh, definitely a, a consideration when specifically choosing fixtures in locations that aren't easily accessible. If it's uh, mm -hmm. over a stairway and it's even difficult to get a ladder there, front entries, higher ceilings, open to below great rooms. In this case, uh, the bulbs are fairly easily, fairly easy to access. You've got to uh, just put your hand right through the crystal and you can do that. That's all crystal hanging in the middle. And I think there's probably six to 12 bulbs in this fixture, depending on the size. And uh, so this, this one, we, we've used um, the smallest version as island pendants, um, bedside pendants, and, and then we get uh, the largest size as a single large great room fixture. It's uh, lots of application for this piece. Nice. Cool. This is an interesting, interesting piece. It reminds me of uh, kind of like a wagon wheel without the, the rim on it. I, I like the look. It looks like a modern take on, on a classic, in my opinion, but... That's exactly, that's exactly where we kind of got the idea from. This is one that we designed ourselves uh, and uh, worked, with, uh, worked with our supplier on this. Uh, you can also do different things to this one in regards to uh, changing the candle sleeves, changing a couple of the accent pieces to different finishes that come in the box with it, chrome, gold, uh, or keep it all black if you'd like. Um, we, we took the chain off of this one to give it that little bit more modern appeal. Um, again, this one can be used uh, over a dining room. Um, we've used it in front entries. We've used it in, uh, in offices. With that, with that many light bulbs, uh, you do get a lot of light from this piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a nice sharp piece. Uh, here's, I guess, it would be a, a semi-flush. Um, yeah. And I guess that's a good little topic to discuss for a second. So if you're in a, you know, 50s bungalow and you've got that classic eight foot or seven foot 11 ceiling height, but you still want to be able to see some difference within your lighting. I mean, the semi-flush light is a great way that you can, you know, get a bit of a different look out of it while not compromising your head height. But where would you see something like this being used most often? So uh, a couple of things, one with this one being having that it's a fabric uh, drum around the side. Uh, we find that a lot of people like to use these in bedrooms. It softens softens the light a little bit as opposed to maybe the hard surfaces like a glass. Um, having the fixture drop off the ceiling like that increases the amount of light significantly. One thing that a lot of people don't think about um, specifically is that the ceiling is is 
almost always white, which also then makes it the most reflective surface in any room. So if you have the light fixture drop off the ceiling like that, you get a lot more light reflecting off your ceiling, making the space feel bigger. And that is very beneficial in areas where you have a seven foot 11 ceiling uh, and, and just to fill the room with light. Nice. Yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's really helpful information because I think people don't often understand why fixtures are designed in a certain way. And it's not just about the, the visual aesthetic. How does the fixture look? It's what it does with the light. Where does it allow it to, you know, to shine and where does it reflect? And, and really, like, you can pick some really cool fixtures that reflect light and create this really interesting pattern on the ceiling. Maybe not breasts like that last one, but, you know, I mean, it can be part of your plan is to get some really interesting shadow lines. But uh, if you want it consistent, then something like this probably is a great option. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left here. And I'll talk a bit about um, Charity Day. Something you guys put on on an annual basis, I believe. And can you tell me a bit about that? Sorry, the slide's not great quality here, but you guys have been doing a lot to raise some money for different charities. And can we talk a bit about that? Yeah, certainly. So we, uh, we uh, as a company, have decided uh, four, four days a year, so four Saturdays, and we try to pick our, bu our busiest Saturdays uh, to donate every dollar spent in the store that day to charity. Uh, we've been fairly connected with a number of uh, organizations. We try to do... Uh, two local and uh, two international. Uh, our lo the local charities we've supported are um, Hope Mission. Uh, there's one that's very close to our heart. Uh, I have a brother-in-law that works for Hope Mission, and then I also have uh, my sister uh, worked for Hope Mission for quite a long time, um, organization that helps people with, uh, um, helps women get off the street or, or with uh, drug and alcohol problems and, and try to get them back on their feet. Uh, Rehoboth is an organization that uh, uh, helps people with uh, mental handicap uh, disabilities and, and going into adulthood and they have a number of homes where they have in-home care for people uh, and then we do two international uh, organizations it's basically both through an organization called World Renew and World Renew uh, is a disaster relief organization and they go they they're all over the world they I mean if there's a hurricane or an earthquake they're there but at the same time they try to create uh, long-term solutions for problems so areas in Africa where there's famine they teach people how to farm if areas where there's uh, a lot of poverty They teach the community how to build each other up and create um, banking services where banking banks can't really get involved and, and create long-term sustainability. Uh, we made a, a company decision a, a long time ago to make this a big part of our, our company and, uh, and uh, it's, it's obviously something very close to our hearts. Yeah, you guys do a great job with that. So thanks and congratulations at, at the same time. Um, one more thing to talk about, I guess, is um, Park lighting and furniture. We haven't talked about the furniture side too much because the topic today was lighting design and, and fixtures, but let's talk a bit about the furniture side of, of your operation now and, and what what that means for your customers and, and for you guys at the company. So we got involved in furniture roughly about four, four years ago, and uh, it was always something that we thought would be uh, something that we wanted to get into. I mean, we're using our ceiling space. Why not use the floor space and square footage a little bit? A little bit better. Um, at the same time, we have uh, basically all the clients' design information. So we, we've they've done all their paint colors, they've done all their finishing details, and they're coming to pick lighting just about last. And that's also the same time they should be thinking about furniture and and you know what is this light going to be hanging over? Uh, you know what what uh, what finishes are going into your bedroom and, and those kinds of things. And we thought that would be a really easy way to tie in at the same time with a lot of the clients that we're working with we have their floor plans so we can even space plan with them and really uh really help design the space with the lighting and the furniture all involved together mm -hmm. absolutely that kind of ties back into our conversation somewhat about la not, not layering as much as how the space works together and it's important to know where your furniture is going to be because if you have a massive couch um maybe with a raised back height in one area if that's going to block the switches that's a problem, right? So that your furniture should be something you're, you're planning well in advance of your floor plan um, in regards to the renovation, because there's some considerations to, to take or to make there as well. So um, we have a winner and I'm just looking for her. Here she is. She's commented a couple of times. Jasmine, man, you're the winner of the two boxes of the Edison string light. So congratulations. Um, what's the best way for you to get these? You come by your your showroom to pick them up. Do you want to? What works best for you? Yeah, I would say uh, we'll we'll put them aside under your under uh, your last name and uh, okay. have them put aside for you. 
Okay, sounds good. Jasmine, I'll send you a direct message here later and we'll get your information. I'll get it over to Jared. All right, well, um, yeah, I mean, we have lots of other pictures we could show just how lighting can work. I'm a big fan of the under cabinet and putting lighting where, you know, it can add not only, like in this case, a little bit of task lighting in the, in the uh, toaster area, but also it helps to light up the display on the shelf and it's a nice touch, right? It looks good. This didn't add much money uh, to the cost of the job, but it takes a bit of foresight as far as where the wires come out of the wall, right? You need to plan all these things. So I think, you know, in general, planning is key um, with any renovation project. And certainly with lighting considerations, um, it's a major factor in making sure you get the job done right the first time and the look that you want and the functionality out of the space. Because you can imagine, um, you know, at the tail end of it all, you think you're almost on your reno. If you're opening walls and ceilings again to, to rewire, you've got a headache upon you. So, um, yeah, here's just some, a couple of pictures I'll, I'll go through here. I don't think these are actually co-compliant anymore as far as putting the hanging pendant or the chandelier above the bathtub. I think you can imagine why if you stood up and you grabbed onto these, you could be a great uh, conductor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The other, thing, the other thing you mentioned was, uh, uh, you know, lighting up uh, under cabinet lighting in different task areas, but to also consider what, what are the features in your house? So in the last picture that you had, you had the nice wood shelves. That's a beautiful detail, but they're going to stand out way more if you put a little light on them, make them stand out. People, people's eyes automatically drawn to what's lit up. So if you have a, a picture or, or a design detail, something that you want lit up, the wood, the wood shelves in this case, light them up and that'll, that'll definitely and certainly draw people's attention to those and make them more of a feature. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to try a video. I don't know how well it's going to work, but here's the kitchen we did a couple of years ago. And you can see with that LED light strip, how it makes a real feature out of that oval bulkhead. And it's just one of those things to consider, right? I mean, how do you want your kitchen to look? This, this lighting strip is programmable. Like you can program it to match the beat of your music. You can go one color to, you know, it's Valentine's Day, it's red or green for St. Patrick's Day, or you can have it on, you know, on random like it is now. And it, it creates a really nice effect. And maybe it's some nice background lighting while you are watching a movie in the adjacent room whatever, right? It's all about options. And again, here's how it looks, just one solid color, which is pretty sharp too, right? So, um, you know, going to RGBK is an option. It costs a little bit more, but then you have uh, a lot of variety within what you can make the space look like and, you know, going with your themes and whatnot. So um, we got about three minutes left. So I guess we should probably get into wrapping this up. So Jared, thanks so much for coming on the show. Um, you know, if you're at home, you're considering renovation, whether it be just getting lighting fixtures, whether you're doing a major reno and you're going to redesign your whole lighting plan. I think a great starting point is going by to see Jared and the team at Park Lighting. Um, they can help you with understanding your space, what fixtures to use, what might be practical, considering some limitations you might have at home and not be aware of, you know, and great. Bring your phone, show them some pictures. Um, if you're planning a larger scale rental, you need somebody to help with actually doing the electrical layouts to make sure it's all going to work. Then you need a general contractor, someone like me, feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help. But uh, again, Jared, thanks so much. And like I mentioned, the start of the show, you and Jen did a great job getting me the information I needed, very organized. So I think that um, speaks uh, volumes for how you run your business as well. So, so good for you guys and uh, great to have you on the show. Um, let's see here. I'll, if I can find my slide, I'll say goodbye with my information on the screen, but uh, the joy of Instagram, there we go. So I'm Paul Foster. I am uh, the host of the Auto Renovation Live. We do this now every second week, and we'll talk about different topics each week. The idea is that it's educational. Um, I help introduce you to my network of vendors and sub trades to show who my team would be and uh and resources for you to help make sure you're set up for success from the start um even if you don't want to hire a general contractor you need just some you need some advice i'm happy to help you out i'll talk with you a bit and give you some points and tips and help you avoid a few landmines along the way the same as i'm sure that jared would do as far as you know helping you making sure you pick the right lighting and and whatnot so um we'll be shut down in about 30 seconds so thanks again great to have you on the show Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, thanks for the uh, giveaway item. Congratulations, Jasmine. And uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks where we talk about uh, custom glass.
should be uh, should be good. You'll be amazed how much glass can change a space. So, um, we'll we'll talk to you then. All right. Thanks a lot, Jared. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Bye bye. This has been the Art of Renovation Live.